Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Good morning. Our speaker this morning is Dr. James Thames. He is Associate Professor of Christian Education, Associate Academic Dean for Academic Administration. He studied at Grace University before coming to Dallas, where he uh, then earned his THM degree in 1985 and later finished a doctorate in uh, educational administration from the University of North Texas in 1997. In my 25 years at Dallas Seminary, Jim has been a part of our fabric here of this institution, a reliable colleague, a faithful man, and one who probably knows the uh, fabric of the seminary, its accrediting processes like no one else uh, among us. From his unique position as a faculty member and administrative staff member, he understands frontline teaching as well as behind the, sci- the, the behind the scenes logistics. Uh, since coming to the seminary in 1984, starting to serve on the staff, he has served in a variety of positions. He also was involved in establishing a professional association for registrars and admission officers for theological schools. His areas of special interest, as I mentioned, include administration and accreditation in Christian higher education. In addition, he's an ordained minister, has been involved in overseas ministry and very active as a churchman at North Highlands Bible Church, where he currently teaches an adult Sunday school class and serves as chairman of the Board of Elders. Dr. Thames and his wife Lori have two daughters, Steffi and Abby, and he considers his family to be the greatest earthly blessing of his life. His wife Lori is here. Lori, would you stand? And would you welcome Jim Thames to the pulpit and uh, thereby recognize them both. Sounds like I have job security, Mark. (laughs) It was Thursday, December 22nd, 2005. When in late in the afternoon, I got a phone call that I had been anticipating from my wife, Lori. And uh, we were actually waiting for the results of a biopsy that she had taken a few days earlier, dreading the news that we might hear, hoping beyond hope that the answer that we would get from the pathologist was no problem. I picked up the phone, and she couldn't speak. She just cried. And thus began a journey with, as the doctors clinically say, invasive ductal carcinoma, breast cancer. And for the next year, we experienced surgery and radiation and chemotherapy and we went through a, quite a turmoil. I would call that a fiery trial. Well, I'm happy to say she's here. <laughs> we have some good friends, Howard and Ann Joslin, who uh, have been close to us for many years, go to our church. Um, during that time, Ann, who is one of Lori's closest friends, Um, was going with her regularly when I couldn't for chemo treatments and things like that. And all that time, she was kind of struggling with some health issues and didn't seem to be very consequential. Her husband, Howard, graduated from DTS with his THM that that same year, 2006 now. And uh, uh, right after graduation on Saturday, Sunday night, he had a heart attack. And it was mild. And fortunately, the doctors were able to treat it. And uh, he is still with us. But later that summer, um, Anne went in and finally had surgery to remove her spleen and discovered that she too had cancer. But that story wasn't as good. And she died on May 2nd, 2008, leaving Howard with four kids and a boatload of questions about God's goodness and God's purpose. I suspect that most of you listening here today have experienced your own trials and struggles. I look around, see Chris over here. 
I see colleagues of mine on the platform that I know have struggled. Some of you have difficulty in classes, the untimely death of a loved one, an unfulfilled marriage or relationship, lingering pain or illness, wayward children, hostile work environment, loss of a job, financial pressures. Many of you are out of money. I know, because the seminary has most of it. <laughs> and the leering question that stares us in the face every day is why? Why me? Why now? Why this? Well, I don't know if I have uh, easy answers to the question, but I hope I have some hope. Because when I'm struggling with things, there are two passages of Scripture that encourage me. And those passages are found in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, and also in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. And we're going to spend most of our time in, in James, and I'll flip over to, to Peter occasionally. Uh, but... Uh, I think that there is some hope for us as we face the trials and struggles that God brings our way in life. When uh, James uh, wrote his book and when Peter wrote his book, I think they knew what they were talking about. They had experienced trials and persecutions and struggles themselves. They knew many of their brothers and sisters in Christ who were undergoing persecution for the name of Christ during that time. Many had been scattered. In fact, we know both letters were written to, to believers, Jewish believers who had been scattered around the world because of persecution. I think it's interesting too, and while I don't have really any strong exegetical support for this, um, I, I find it interesting that in both letters, the discussion on trials is right at the beginning, right out of the chute. Both of them address that before they talk about the rest of the things in the letters that they want us to know. And I think, I think there's a reason for that. And I think the reason is, is because how we deal with the trials and struggles of life is foundational to our Christian growth. It's a barometer, if you will. It's an indicator of how we're doing in our relationship with God. These few verses in both of these chapters, but specifically in James, tell us how we deal with the struggles of life. And what I want to do this morning is just kind of highlight four observations that I've kind of uh, focused on when I read these that I hope will give us some encouragement and help as we deal with the difficulties of life. The first one, instead of complaining about your problems, Face them with joy. Instead of complaining about your problems, face them with joy. Look at uh, James chapter 1, verse 2. Right off, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Uh, now, I got to confess, that is not an easy thing to do. When I got a call from Lori, I wasn't very joyful. When Ann died, I wasn't very joyful. For those of you that have experienced trauma and tragedy in your lives, the truth is, we aren't very joyful. It's hard to find joy in the midst of all of the difficulties that we deal with. So how do you do that? How can we find joy in the midst of the overwhelming difficulties that we face? Well, I think, the answer is by knowing who's in control. You think about it, in, in 2 Corinthians, if you remember chapter 12, when Paul is talking about his thorn in the flesh and the fact that he prayed to have God removed it, remove it and, and God wouldn't remove it, but he said this when he finally came to the conclusion, and this was God's answer to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Notice what Paul says. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
A.W. Tozer is someone whose books I have read throughout the years, and I love him. He has a way of capturing the feelings and emotions of the Christian life. And uh, in one particular uh, situation, he was uh, reflecting on a comment or a quote from the writings of Samuel Rutherford, who was a 17th century Scottish Presbyterian theologian and author. And uh, he was known for the comment that, that was this, praise God, Rutherford said, for the hammer, the file, and the furnace. An odd comment. And Tozer, who uh, was reflecting on that, had these words to say, and I want to read it to you because I think it's a powerful illustration of the, the importance of these things in our lives. Tozer says, it, it was the enraptured Rutherford who could shout in the midst of serious and painful trials, praise God for the hammer, the file, and the furnace. The hammer is a useful tool, but the nail, if it had feelings and intelligence, could present another side of the story. For the nail knows the hammer only as an opponent, a brutal, merciless enemy who lives to pound it into submission, to beat it down out of sight and clinch it into place. That is the nail's view of the hammer, and it is accurate except for one thing. The nail forgets that both it and the hammer are servants of the same workman. Let the nail remember that the workman holds the hammer and all resentment toward it will disappear. The carpenter decides whose head shall be beaten next, what hammer shall be used in the beating. That is his sovereign right. When the nail has surrendered to the will of the workman and has gotten a little glimpse of his plans for its future, it will yield to the hammer without complaint. The file is more painful still. For its business is to bite into the soft metal, scraping and eating away the edges till it has shaped the metal to its will. Yet the file has, in truth, no real will in the matter, but serves another master, as the metal also does. It is the master, and not the file, that decides how much shall be eaten away, what shape the metal shall take, and how long the painful filing shall continue. Let the metal accept the will of the master, and it will not try to dictate when or how it should be filed. As for the furnace, it's the worst of all. Ruthless and savage, it leaps at every combustible thing that enters it and never relaxes its fury till it has reduced it all to shapeless ashes. All that refuses to burn is melted to a mass of helpless matter without will or purpose of its own. When everything is melted that will melt and all is burned that will burn then and not till then, the furnace calms down and rests from its destructive fury. With all this known to him, how could Rutherford find it in his heart to praise God for the hammer, the file, and the furnace? The answer is simply that he loved the master of the hammer. He adored the workman who wielded the file. He worshiped the Lord who heated the furnace for the everlasting blessing of his children. How do we find joy in the midst of trials? Recognizing who's in control. Recognizing that he has purpose. That's the only way. Doesn't make it easy, but it's the only way. So instead of complaining and finding joy, the first thing, there's another thing, and that's that we need to expect trials in life. They are inevitable. If you look at uh, verse... To you again, toward the end, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, when you face trials of many kinds. It's not an if, it's a when. Now, it's not a guarantee, but experience tells us, and I think the passage reminds us that we are going to face difficulties. It's not a matter of if, it is just a matter of when. And most of you sitting here already know about the when, because you're already embroiled in them. Now, just a, a comment about the word for trials here, because the word that is used is often used uh, for temptation in the New Testament, but it's also used to mean the nature or character of something, a, a test or a trial, the means of, of finding that out. 
And I think that that's the best use here and in, in Peter. And I, I take that because in verse 4, he talks about the testing of our faith. And that implies, again, it's that, that testing implying that there's a genuineness to us, a genuineness to our faith. And besides, he goes on later in verse 13 of the same chapter, and he talks about the fact that God doesn't tempt us. We're tempted when we are carried away by our own evil desires, but God himself does not tempt. Now, having said that, I think there are times when the temptations that we face and when we don't succumb to those temptations also have the same benefit to us as a trial. They cause us to grow. They, they cause us to endure. They are difficult experiences. But we're really focusing here on trials. You know, let's face it, the world we live in, I don't think, is the world that God initially created. Do you? We are all uh, beneficiaries. We all endure the aftermath of Genesis 3. We live in a fallen world, a world marred by sin, a world where death is a regular and inevitable occurrence, where disease and illness and troubles and woes plague us, even those who name Christ as Lord and Savior. In fact, Jesus said in, in the Gospel of John, in the Upper Room Discourse, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Trials are inevitable. They're the norm for us, more than the exception. We need to learn how to deal with them. There's a third thing. Trials are not necessarily the result of something you've done wrong. Now hear me say that. Trials are not necessarily the result of something you've done wrong. One of the first questions Lori asked and Anne asked when they were diagnosed with cancer is why? What, what did I do wrong that caused this to happen? Was there some sin in my life? Was there a, was a mistake? Was I not following God faithfully enough? Was I not loving my children, my husband, running my home, serving the Lord well enough? Is that why this happened? That's a normal question. And if, and if we were really honest with ourselves, I think it's a question that all of us ask, isn't it? When we run into difficulties like that. And on the one hand, maybe, maybe it's a fair question to ask. Because there are probably times in our lives, I know there have been times in my life when I have dealt with things that were really uh, my own fault. Things that I did that got me into trouble. Things that I did that I knew I shouldn't have done. And I bore the consequences of those things. And so it's true that there are going to be difficulties in life that we face that may be the result of, difficult, of, of mistakes that we make. But I'm not sure that that's the norm, and I'm sure it's not the focus in this passage. James doesn't say anything at all in these verses about trials being a result of discipline or punishment. Not here. He says they have a different purpose. Trials are not the necess necessarily the result of something that we've done wrong. If you flip over to 1 Peter 6, Peter says exactly the same thing. It says, now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I like the a little while part, you know. It, it reminds me that they're not going to be permanent. Uh, at least I won't deal with them in heaven, okay. So we have that hope, right. But these come so that your faith may be proved genuine. The man born blind. When the disciples asked Jesus who sinned, his parents or him, Jesus said, no one, but that God's glory might be revealed. So don't assume automatically that just because you're going through a difficult time that that's a result of something you've done wrong. Maybe that's a good question to ask. Maybe a little self-examination is healthy. But I think more often than not, we just need to expect the difficulties of life and it's just a result of the world we live in. Not a pleasant thing, but a reality nonetheless. 
The fourth thing I want us to observe is that instead of seeing trials as roadblocks, look at them as opportunities. My wife has a small framed quote in our house sitting on a shelf, says this, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. I like that. Very well disguised, I might add. What opportunities do trials provide us then? Well, I think they provide opportunities for us to grow in our faith. Look at verse 4. Perseverance must finish its work that, so that you may be mature and complete. That m word mature is, is perfect, is, is a word that, that implies that we have become more like what God wants us to be. That word for complete is actually a, a com combination of two words, the word whole and the word parts. So it's whole in every part, in every way complete and perfect. James says that trials develop our capacity to hold up in the face of difficulty. That word for perseverance here is the word that is often translated as patience, endurance, fortitude, steadfastness. And that endurance and steadfastness results in our maturity. That's encouraging. Makes it a little easier for me to deal with some of those things when I know that there's a positive end result in store for me. Doesn't mean I like it any better. Doesn't mean I'm out looking for difficult times to just make sure that I'm growing. They come plenty often by themselves without any uh, extra work on my part. Uh, believe me. Opportunities to grow in our faith, but also opportunities to be a testimony of God's grace in the midst of life's problems to a world that has no such hope. You think about that? Do you know that people watch how you deal with the difficulties in your life, especially if they know you're a believer? Because they expect you just to act like everybody else. I don't think they expect us not to grieve. I don't think they expect us to be happy about every little problem that happens in our lives, but I do think that they look to see how we're gonna respond. How do we deal with death, with cancer, with failure, with debilitating diseases, with our marital problems that we, we often see in the seminary family? All of those things are pressures with our kids, all of the things we mentioned at the beginning. How do we respond to those? And what does the world see when we respond to those things? Opportunities to grow in our faith, opportunities to be a testimony, opportunities for our lives to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Notice again what Peter said that these trials come, that our faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So ultimately, the things that we go through and how we go through them bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. I would much prefer that to be true of my life than the alternative. Unfortunately, too often people who experience difficulties in life uh, turn their back on their faith. I, I can't say that, that I don't understand it. I can't say that I'm surprised by it. But I wish it wasn't so. And I would say for each and every one of you here today, if you are thinking that, man, all of the things that I believed were gonna happen when I came to Dallas Seminary, man, I was gonna walk into the classroom and cherubim were gonna be ministering to me and the Shekinah glory was gonna be hovering over the pulpit in this chapel and man, it was gonna be the best thing in the world. Uh, has it been? In some respects, yes. 
In a lot of respects, for a lot of you, absolutely not. It's been a rough go of it. And for some of you, you may be really questioning, you know, I thought God had called me to this place. I, I thought that calling would make things easier. Where's the easy? Golly, I look at these guys up here and I wonder how merciless can anybody be? <laughs> and some of you are probably toying with the idea that maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you ought not to be here. Maybe, maybe it really wasn't, you know, God's call on your life. Maybe you just have an indigestion that day. I don't know who said this. I asked my friend Greg. He, he thinks it was uh, from, from Sweeting, George Sweeting at Moody, but it was somebody who once said, don't doubt in the dark what God has revealed to you in the light. I love that. Because in the darkness, we don't make very good decisions. When our emotions are overwhelming us because of the problems we face, we don't think clearly. We need to take a step back and we need to remind ourselves that there was a time when we had confidence that God was calling us to do something. And in spite of the fact that I'm not passing Hebrew, I am gonna stick with it. I mean, what's the worst thing that happens? You know, you take it again. Maybe a third time. Why are you guys laughing? Opportunities for our lives to bring glory to Jesus Christ, to show the world that we are different because of him. And also, these trials are opportunities for God to refine us. Man, I look at the faculty on this stage and I can tell stories about each one who have wrestled and struggled with problems. Jim Allman, whose daughter just lost her twins. Is that a trial? Greg Hatterberg, whose wife Lisa has been bedridden with MS for years. Those who have lost family, those who have experienced health problems, those who are dealing with aged parents, those who have all sorts of struggles. I look at Hall Harris and the problems and health problems that he and his wife and family have had. Ron Allen, who has struggled with headaches ever since what seemed to be kind of a simple bike fall at the time. We just don't know, but I've watched these men and women deal with those difficulties in life. And you know what I've seen? I haven't seen one of them walk away. I haven't seen one of them turn their back on the word or the faith. What I have seen as I've seen them grow and mature. What a blessing to be a part of this group. What a blessing you have to sit under their teaching, as difficult as that may be on occasion. I have in my pocket <clears throat> a pine cone. Not much bigger than a golf ball, Greg, but you can't have it for your collection. And I know most of you can't see it because it's very small. But this cone is not really a pine cone. It's the cone of a giant sequoia. The sequoias are the largest, oldest living things on earth. And to get a, a picture of how big they are, you can't, unless you've been to California, unless you've seen these, you really can't get a picture of them. But this one picture, I think, gives you, hopefully, an idea of how big they really are. Guys, if you have that. And that's not one of the big ones. They estimate that some of these trees are over 3,500 years old. I can't wrap my arms around that. I was thinking about that before I came. David was alive when some of these trees started growing. That'll open your eyes. If you have been there, I promise you that there is not a cathedral built to God in the world. 
more majestic, that honors the creator of the universe. Wow, it's amazing. And you know, these trees produce several thousand of these every year. And they fall on the ground and they lie there dormant until fire. And what happens in a fire is that the heat from that fire opens up these cones so that the seeds are released. And it burns up the, the undergrowth and the needle humus and all of the things on the ground that prevent these things from taking root. And it clears the, uh, the ground so that sunlight can get through. And then because the soil is enriched and the sunlight gets through, these things will take root. They sprout, they grow. And boy, do they grow. It takes the heat of a fire to open the cone and release the tiny seeds. It takes the fire to clear the undergrowth. It takes fire for them to grow. Trials in our lives are a lot like the fire needed for the giant sequoia to grow. They're a necessary part of life. Unfortunately, the fire of the trials that we face, like Samuel Rutherford's furnace, burns, and it's painful. Sometimes the only thing that gets our attention is the pain of trials. And we're pretty comfortable in this society, and even the problems that we have pale in comparison to the problems that many people in the world experience. But they're still our problems, and they're still painful. I like the well-worn C.S. Lewis quote, which sums it up best, you know it well. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Are you listening? Are you reminded when you're going through the difficulties of life that they have purpose for you. You know, we may never have the, the answer why, the specific answer to the questions about why I'm going through this difficult time. Uh, you know, as far as I know, Job never had the answer. We have the benefit of perspective because we read the story. He didn't have the story. But I find it fascinating that in spite of that, he was still able to say but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. So as I wrap this up, my prayer for you when you face life's storms is four things. That you'll maintain an attitude of joy in the difficulties that you face. That you'll prepare yourselves for the inevitability of the problems that will come, especially those of you who are headed into full-time ministry. That you won't automatically assume that when problems happen, that it's a result of something that you've done wrong. It may have a far more glorious purpose than that. I pray that you will see trials and difficulties not as roadblocks, but as opportunities. Not as reasons to give up, but as opportunities to grow in your relationship with the God who loves you. Last year in chapel, Johnny Erickson Tata was here, and she made this comment, and, and I'm we're not going to sit down and debate with the guys about its theological implications, but I love it anyway. And in fact, Lori, I think this would be another good saying to put on the shelf. God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. Do you believe that? I need to hear it, because when the difficulties of life come, they're hard. They're not easy to deal with. I have all those questions. Sometimes I really do question what God is doing. But maybe in those times when I'm at my weakest, maybe when things are the hardest, maybe that's the time for me to know he loves me. Let's pray. Father, we uh, confess that in our weakness, we, 
we push against, we struggle with, we wrestle with the difficulties and trials of our lives, we question their purpose, we question uh, your goodness. We confess that. Father, it doesn't always make it easier knowing that you have purpose in these things, that you will use them in our lives as you've promised, that, that good will come of them, that you have a higher purpose. Sometimes it just doesn't help. But in those moments when we have the opportunity to pause and reflect, I pray that we will be reminded that the things that happen in our lives happen for a purpose and that you'll love us. Enough to... to Suffer yourself on our behalf on the cross. What a blessing. So, Father, today we thank you for the trials of life. May we be found faithful in how we respond to them. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen.